times through each x-intercept. Notice each of these functions have what kind of values right here? Negative. negative. What's a negative? And, and notice how many negatives are there? Three. Three. What's a negative times a negative times a negative? A negative. A negative. That's why this section is negative for g of x. In this region, and I will point this out, color coding can be helpful here, but in this region, I have a positive, a negative, and a negative. What's a positive times a negative times a negative? That's a positive. Right? So it goes into the positives. But I know it has to start going, decreasing, going back down because it's got to get to the what? Zero. To that zero here. And then I look at the next region. And in this region, I have this section, this piece, and this piece. Notice I go up to the next x-intercept. Positive or negative? Hold on one second. Positive or negative right here? That's negative. Two positives and a negative. Well, I'm just saying this, this, this one. Oh, that's positive. That's positive. Positive. Negative. negative. If you do a positive number times a positive number times a negative number, you're getting a negative. negative. And so that's why it dips back down. And it's got to come back up, increase, and it'll go straight up like this. All right? Salita, what's your question? Do you determine the regions or whatever by what's in between the point that you want to make and the one in between? When you say the points, what points are you referring to? That, so be more clear with that language, and yes, the x-intercept. Because remember, what's another um, term for that x-intercept? A zero. And zeros are in between what set of numbers? Zero. Not just negative one and one. If you look at a number line, what's on the left side of zero? Negative, negative numbers. What's on the right hand side? Positive. So those zeros are when it changes from being negative to positive or from positive back to negative. So you, you identify each region by the x-intercept by the zeros and then you look at the factors within that region. Notice, if I look at this region, all three of those functions are negative all the way up to this x-intercept. It's only at this x-intercept that one of them changes. Right? That's how you get the other one? The polynomial, yeah. Does that explain it? Um, and so notice I, I wrote all this out and I will say I think I've already posted this on Schoology. I'll make sure I do that second block if I have it. But I have all of these details on there, right? Uh, whether a section around the x-intercept is positive or negative can be determined by just multiplying the types of values for each function or for each factor, right? On that left-hand side, we have three negative values multiplied yielding a negative. Um, and so I have justification there with all of that. And so that gray curve in there is the uh, polynomial g of x. Okay. Now I do want you all to pay attention to this because I do want to show and reward the thinking of some of us um, here. Some of us tried to use f of x, but we're not as familiar with sketching that f of x right away, although you could have done it if I look just at f of x, what type of function is that? Quadratic. Quadratic, so what shape should I see? Parabola. A parabola, right? With what x-intercepts? Four and negative, negative two and negative four. Y'all gotta remember, this one thing that a lot of us were missing, I saw a lot of people say four comma zero and two comma zero, but you gotta remember in factored form, it's x minus r1 and x minus r2. You always need the opposite. It's better to go ahead and use that zero product property set equal to zero. Okay, so negative one, two, three, four, and negative two comma zero. That's the x-intercepts for f of x. Now, it wouldn't have been super accurate, but what else do you know about this quadratic function, this parabola? What else can you... Thank you. I saw so many of us put a concave down parabola here. And I assume it's because we were seeing negative x-intercepts. But what determines the concavity? A. a. And this A is understood to be a positive 1. So this should have been a concave up parabola. That is a rough sketch of f of x. I could have gotten more accurate, but that's the rough sketch of f of x. 
And then what other function would I need to draw here? I don't know what parabola can be this thing. Huh? I thought the parabola had to like go all the way over uh, the okay. It will let me point this out, Madison. You see how it has arrows here? It's not just going up, it's also going out. And so eventually it'll expand out, but we're only looking at a small part of the graph. If I wanted to be more accurate, I could have substituted my x values in. Um, negative 3 plus 4 is 1, negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1, so it actually would have only gone to here. I could have plugged in negative 1, would be 3 times 1 is 3. And so I could have been more accurate like this. Um, that'd be 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And so this would be a more accurate parabola, but notice it's still not that wide. And it still has the same general shape. Um, I know some of us may be looking at like how in the world did you get that, but all I did was I substituted my x values in. That's all a function is, right? The inputs and the outputs. If I substitute in an x value of zero, f of zero, notice zero took the place of x. Um, so it's zero plus four times zero plus two. That's four times two, which is eight. Right, so there's a point zero comma eight, and so that's how you get each of those points. I'm not looking for that level of accuracy right now, but you should at least recognize that it's concave up and the x-intercepts. But that's my f of x. Nice smooth curve in there. And so, what other function do I still need to graph? X or y equals x. Y equals x, which is a y-intercept of zero and a slope of one. By the way, what can you use to help you graph <coughs> lines on the assessments? Calculator. Um, no. A ruler. A what? A ruler. A ruler. Right? Can't a ruler really help you draw a line? But regardless, I can still get my function off of this, even though those don't intersect, they don't have to. I know for this polynomial, f of x is positive, y equals x is negative. What's a positive times a negative? Negative. negative. <sighs> is that how the polynomial started out earlier? Yeah. yeah. And then here I have, here's my next region based on that x-intercept. Negative times negative is? Positive. Positive. Do we see positive here for that polynomial? Yep. yep. Then I have this region, yep, here. What's a positive times a negative? Negative. Negative. And it's going to come back up and be positive. That's a rough sketch. What are you freaking out about? Who? Whoever's freaking out in that group right there. I drew that, but I got a zero minus. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that you probably did not I might have messed up. I'll look at it in a second. But instead of freaking out, just say, hey, Mr. Kenny, do you think you made a mistake? And I'll look at it later. But um, I, I would imagine that there you might have gotten that general sketch, but if you didn't get those x-intercepts, that's not correct. The only thing that you have to get right with those sketches are the x-intercepts and whether it's positive or negative. That's the only thing. If you didn't get those x-intercepts, it's not correct. So did, did you get accurate x-intercepts there? I believe so. You got negative 4 comma 0, negative 2 comma 0, and 0 comma 0? I just threw, drew it like backwards, like I flipped it in the light. Then you didn't have those x-intercepts. Did you do 2 comma 0 or 4 comma 0? Yes. Yeah. But remember, it has to be negative 2 and negative 4, right? Using that zero product property, if you looked at your zeros up here, right, 0 is equal to x, 0 is equal to x plus 4, so notice we would subtract 4. Right, so it should be negative 4 and negative 2. That, and like, if you had justified it, I would have been able to give you more credit, but okay. if you draw it incorrectly and don't give me any justification, there's only so much I can yeah. do. Right? So, here's the thing, and don't forget, your grade for this is not done. You learn from your mistakes, you grow, you do better on the test, and you're good to get for me. Yeah. All right. Um, so, again, could you have drawn the parabola and the linear and, and graphed off of that? Yeah. Yes. It would have given you the same function. It's easier to just go off the linear factors, though. Okay, so here's number six. Uh, so we can at least look at lesson four a little bit. I want y'all to look at this. Hey, shh. 
Um, two things. One, same exact idea for graphing, okay? Um, but please notice there are three lines here. So how many factors does the polynomial have? <coughs> three. So you need to be multiplying three times the numbers. Mark off each x-intercept. Boom, boom, and boom. And in this region, one, two, three, a positive times a positive times a negative gives me negative. negative. And you need to justify that. In this second region right here, a positive times a negative times a negative, positive. Here, I've got a positive, positive, and negative, negative. And then here, I've got a positive, negative, negative, which is positive. That's the general shape that we should have seen. Did you go to zero? Zero, zero? Mm -hmm. Remember, everywhere you have an x-intercept with your factors, that is an x-intercept for the polynomial. That is one of the most critical ideas, is that everywhere you have an x-intercept for the factors, you have an x-intercept for the polynomials. That's the key. That's how I get these dashed vertical lines here to know the different regions. It's only at those x-intercepts that it'll ch the polynomial will change from a positive to a negative. Yes, Tori. Where are you pointing to, like, the positive and the negative? So, okay, let, and so this is something I did um, later that I think will be helpful moving forward. But, like, you, see, you understand how I have this vertical line here at the x-intercept, right? Okay. So I'm looking at the three factors to the left. Is, are those values positive or negative? Positive. You're not sure? Is it positive or negative? Which one is? Which one? Which one? Why, why do you think it's positive? Because it's above the x. Right. It's above the x-axis, so it's positive. These are? Positive. And these are? Positive. So if I take a positive number and I multiply it by a positive number and I multiply it by a negative number, what kind of number do I get? Negative. Right. So all of these values were negative up to this x-intercept. Okay? And if I look here, in between these next two x-intercepts, positive or negative? Positive. Negative. Negative. If I take a positive times a negative times a negative, I get a? Positive. Right. Which is why the polynomial was positive there. Does that make sense now? Yeah. Not sure? Maybe a little bit? Okay. Um, okay, for P of X, writing the equation, ladies and gentlemen, how many factors went into P of X? Three. So you needed how many factors when you wrote the equation for P of X? Three. However, the most common mistake I saw students make was this. The most common mistake that I saw students make if they got close. That polynomial would have the correct roots. That polynomial is not correct for this function, though. Every single one of these linear factors would have what kind of slope? Like, Every single one of these linear factors would have what kind of slope? Or would have what slope? What's the slope? Isn't it 1x? What would the y-intercept here be? Not the x-intercept, the y-intercept. Remember, it's mx plus b. What's so zero. Two. So the y-intercept is zero comma two. What's this y-intercept? So you would have to put. Look at those y-intercepts. Is that the same? I guess that one is. But doesn't have a, none of them have a slope of one. So you're saying, like, for inside parentheses, we would have to do the equation for that line. That right. Because okay. this polynomial is based on these linear factors. Mm -hmm. So if I look at this, this function here, and it has a slope of negative 2, a y-intercept of 2. So I need a, oh yeah, see that? 
y intercept of 2 doesn't even go there. So it would have been, um, I have a negative 2x plus 2 times, if I look at this line right here, it's going down 1 to the right 1. Slope is negative 1 with a y-intercept of? So it would be negative x plus 2, or minus 2, right? And then I have this function here, which is literally just y equals x times x. That would be the correct polynomial here. So you cannot just base it on the roots. You have to pay attention to those linear functions, right? So um, I think I added more details in here. Yeah, there's a lot more details here. So you'll notice I color-coded some of this. Um, I identified this line here. Slope is 1. B is 0. So y is equal to 1x plus 0, just y equals x. Wrote this equation here. Got my slope, my y-intercept, and I wrote this equation here as well. And so I made this note, and this is, you can go in and write the equation of those lines later, but notice how I said p of x is the product of those factors. That is the key to this question, that p of x is the product of those factors. And so I wrote out the product of those factors. y'all have for me off this understanding check still. I was still confused like f of x is equal to x plus x plus y that. You know it's, it's all that is is function notation. It's just to name the function and it's to show you inputs and outputs. So like if I say p of x that just means that for an input of x I'm getting out something. And we use p of x versus f of x just to name different functions. Ooh. Because like um, here with this one, notice I have one function right here, right? x plus 4 times x plus 2. That's one function. So we call it f of x. But I dilated f of x by x. So I can't use f of x again because I have a different function. So all that that first letter is is naming a different function. But it's called function notation because it tells us the input x and the output g of x, which remember, what variable do we usually use for the output? X is my input, the output is y. Whenever you have that function notation, that's just the y. But we use f and g and h to indicate new functions. It's because we just we can't call two different functions both f of x. Yes, Madison. What exactly is our understanding check on Lesson like, four. Is it this or what is Lesson four? Yeah. Which lesson four? Which lesson four is what Miss um, Essel has been working on you, working with on you, working on with you that one, um, and it'll be on Monday. But is there any way that you can? We're going to recap a little bit of it, but I'll point this out. Lesson four, the only new thing in lesson four is actually uh, 4.3, where you're distributing and, and multiplying the factors. Lesson four is actually just practice for everything you've been doing and everything we just covered. So lesson four really is not anything new. Okay, so here is some of that recap, though. Okay, quick detail that I want to point out here. Um, some of us earlier when we were dilating, we were showing the function touching the x-axis and then bouncing away. Do we remember that? Okay. But this is the only time that the function, the polynomial would bounce and touch away, or go back away, and it's when you have a double root. Do you see how that x-intercept happens twice right there? That's the only time when it touches and then goes away. But you also don't have to memorize that. Draw in your dashed lines. What's a positive times a negative? Negative, right? So these are negatives. Here I have positive times negative again. So what is that? So it's going to touch the x-axis, bounce away, and then it's going to come back to this x-intercept. And here, what's a positive times a positive? 
if you pay attention to your factors, it's going to tell you if it touches and bounces away or if it goes through. Because if it goes through, it goes from a negative to a positive. If it touches and bounces away, it's going to go from a negative to a negative or positive to a positive. Okay? Um, and you can also draw that table in there, but that's how I got this. All right. Quick recap on lesson three. That was not already supposed to be there like that. Um, this is the planter box. When we looked at the volume function, what type of function was this? When you looked at that volume from lesson three. Exponential. Not exponential. Quadratic. Not quadratic. Oh, no, it was not linear. linear. Not linear. <laughs> Y'all just guessing. Look, remember, wasn't volume the product of height, width, and length? And each of those factors was linear. So it's cubic, right? It has three linear factors. It has three roots. So it's cubic. Does that detail make sense? I also want to point out, what else could you have looked at to know that it was cubic? The bottom row is an H. And well, the three linear factors, but I'll, I, I mostly wanted to point this out. You can look always at the rate of change. Did I put the rate of change in here? I don't think I did. No. Uh, if you look at this rate of change, it's adding 160, adding uh, 64, but then it starts subtracting 8, minus 56, minus 80, minus 80 again and minus 56. It doesn't look like there's a pattern there, but if it's a function, there's always a pattern. You keep it going. Um, this is minus, not 100, minus 96, minus 72, minus 48, 34, close, 24, yep, minus 24, minus 0, and actually plus 24. Still no pattern, right? But it's a function, so it has to have a pattern, right? You just keep, you just keep going. So I keep it going, right? So to go from negative 96 to negative 72, I think it's, I think it's plus, because it's less negative, right? Think about a number line. Negative 96 would be here. Negative 72 would be here, getting closer to 0. So we're adding 24, right? Um, plus... Yeah, plus 24, plus, plus 24, 24, plus 24, plus 24. All right, so this is constant additive, right? What type of function had a constant additive rate of change? Linear. So this change right here is linear additive. So what is the actual rate of change? What type of function had a linear additive rate of change? Quadratic. So this is a quadratic additive which makes this function cubic. Okay, so please notice like we can always look at that rate of change to determine the type of function. Uh, we would see the same thing here. Okay, so I will say this, hear me very clearly, this concept of degree will show up on the understanding check. We don't have time to quickly go over it, but hear me very clearly on this. Madison, I'm talking, so pay attention and stop distracting Peyton. Um, on Schoology, I have posted videos from Carnegie themselves. They're nice and short. If you go into um, Schoology and you go to materials, what unit are we on right now? Three. We're on unit three. About polynomials. If you go into Unit 3, there's a folder that's titled Carnegie Learning Videos. I've made it as straightforward as can be. Okay? They talk about degree and multiplicity there. I think overall you're pretty good with it, but if you need extra help, you can. Right here. Hey, guys, stop. I'll give you time in a second. Pay attention. This right here, haven't we already been talking today about multiplying the factors to be able to sketch the function? So, Madison, there's nothing new in activity 4.1. It's just what we've just been talking about. It's using those linear factors to sketch out the polynomial. Notice also that color coding to help us, or help me. Oh, apparently I forgot to throw on the polynomial. 
Um, and this is the only new thing with using that area model or distribution. I will tell you this because we didn't get there. I'll give you a few minutes to do some practice problems with the multiplication and distribution stuff on Monday before the understanding check. But everything else, you should be good to go on. Okay? Um, here's a quick reminder of your homework. Oh, keep your homework out and leave it on your desk so I can collect it. Um, I definitely feel like there's been some good learning today, but what are all of you? Capable. Capable of more. Thanks for all of you responding. Uh, here are the assignments to keep in mind. Please leave that homework on your desk if you haven't ready to turn in today. Uh, that's the lesson two homework, and then there's Mr. stuff in lesson three as well. Say again, Madison. Madison, it's up on the board. Well then, move up here, girl. It's still on the board. You can take a picture of it if you need to.